Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome back to the IC Interviews. I'm Mary McDougall and I'm particularly excited to introduce today's guest, Professor Russell Napier. Russell is a consultant, investor, historian, writer and teacher. He's advised on asset allocation to global investment institutions since 1995 and is the author of the Solid Ground Investment Report for Institutional Investors. Listeners might be familiar with his books, the most recent being The Asian Financial Crisis, 1995-1998, to Birth of the Age of Debt, which was published last year. He also wrote Anatomy of the Bear, Lessons from Wall Street's Four Great Bottoms. When not writing or advising, Russell is teaching, running a course in finance called The Practical History of Financial Markets, and he's an honorary professor of Harriet Watt and Stirling Universities. Russell started his career at Bailey Giffords before moving to Hong Kong to work as an equity strategist in the mid-1990s. He is currently chairman of Midwind International Investment Trust. Last but not least, Russell is the keeper of the Library of Mistakes, a charitable venture he set up in 2014. Russell, thank you for joining me. How are you? Mary, I'm very well, thank you. I'm glad to join you. I can't help but smile when looking at the mission of the Library of Mistakes to change the world one mistake at a time. And you had a whole week of festivities, or should I say mistake sharing, last week, celebrating the launch of the new venue. Um, what, what were the most interesting things that came out of it? Yeah, well, we, we're trying to do what, uh, what Jim Grant recommended a long time ago, or taught me a long time ago, when he said that in the sciences, progress is cumulative, but in finance, it is merely cyclical. And uh, we're trying to transcend the cyclical, knowing always that we won't succeed. Uh, but just trying to make it slightly better, that somehow we accumulate knowledge and understanding in this business rather than do it on cyclical. So uh, I think the most important speech of the week was definitely by Lord Darling, Alistair Darling, Chancellor of the Exchequer from 2007 to 2010, uh, and that dwelt upon his experiences in the great financial crisis. Uh, And I think the most illuminating thing was a question. Uh, We have a built, we have a, a newspaper headline up in the Library of Mistake called Britain's 500 billion pound bailout and the question for lord darling was did he flinch from writing that check and of course some of it was real money and some of it was a guarantee but ultimately uh, it could have all fallen upon the british taxpayer and his simple answer to that was no and that when uh, given the consequences of not writing the check writing a check even of that magnitude was a fairly straightforward decision so i maybe i knew that maybe i knew that ultimately uh too big to fail is indeed too big to fail, uh, but policymakers don't flinch, whatever the consequences are for their balance sheets. Was that on RBS and he had about three hours to make the decision? He also, it's really worth listening to because he points out just how many hours he had to make this decision. It wasn't days, it wasn't weeks, it wasn't months. It was hours that he had to make this decision. And I think that probably made it easier to, to make it. Otherwise, he'd have had 52 policymakers in the room and economists in the room explaining that on the one hand and on the other hand, and perhaps the time frame made the decision even easier to make. We start by talking about inflation, because it's something that lots of investors are worried about. You were a disinflationist, if that's the right term. And in 2020, when governments wrote massive stimulus checks, um, effectively taking control of the money supply, you changed your view. Please, can you explain what your outlook for inflation is? Sure. So what people need to understand is how money is made. So rather than me go through that, Mary, there's a fantastic little article on the Bank of England website called How Money is Made. So people can read that. But effectively, it's made by the commercial banking system. It is not made by the central bank, and it's certainly not made by the government. And the transformation in monetary policy occurred with the outbreak of COVID. And uh, as we are learning to our cost, uh, a lot of these loans that were made during COVID are not going to be repaid and some of them may have been fraudulently obtained. But the important thing is none of those loans were from the British government. They were all from the banking system. And what the government did is to guarantee those loans. So they said to the banks, look, we know this money isn't going to be repaid. We know that some of it may be stolen, but don't worry, you just come to us and we will make sure that you cannot lose any money on these COVID loans. So in my opinion, Mary, and I'm having a real problem convincing the marketplace of this, that means the government now runs monetary policy, not the central bank. And then feedback I get is that, okay, so the government is forcing the banks to make these loans and create money. But as soon as COVID's over, they'll stop. And then, of course, Boris Johnson turns up about six weeks ago and makes another one of these loans to Jaguar Land Rover. Once again, it's the banks making the loans. He guarantees the credit. Emmanuel Macron and his prime minister, Castex, have said that they will be doing exactly the same thing. So the transformation here is that the government through carrots and sticks, 
is controlling the balance sheets of the commercial banks. And according to the Bank of England, that means the governments now are in the business of making money. And if that's true, prepare for inflation because the governments will make too much money. Because remember, they are using it to finance all their pet projects. And those pet projects are growing rapidly. Uh, it's not just that we need a, a climate change emergency investment project. We now need an energy diversification emergency investment because of Russia. But absolutely more important than something we might come on to is we need a massive investment project to diversify away from our China risks. So the inflation call is not the one that you usually hear and see in the front page of the newspapers. It's much more systemic than that, which is the governments effectively control the commercial banks. They will use them to fund all of this investment and in doing so create a lot of money and create a lot of, of inflation. Wow, there's loads to pick through there. We'll go through them one by one. So we're speaking at 10 a.m. on the 4th of May. There's been lots of hype in the media about markets, in, in the markets, preparing for a rate rise. From what you're talking about, if the government controls the money supply, is it, is it very interesting what the central banks do? Yeah, I mean, that is, the, that is the crucial question here. And obviously, I'm not that interested in what central banks are doing. Now, that would get me a lot of, into a lot of trouble with my clients who think that central banks are the be-all and end-all of everything. But monetary policy is not the price of money, ultimately. It's the quantity of money. Uh, you should think more as the price of money as the uh, brake or the accelerator in a car, but it's not the engine. Uh, the engine is the commercial banking system. So let us say that interest rates begin to rise, but Boris Johnson or Joe Biden continually say to the banks, well, look, don't worry about this because the money you lend, you cannot lose any money on it. And the banks keep accelerating their lending and creating money. It means that the pedal, the control of the engine has been severed. It's been taken away. And these interest rates are become less important. I'm not sitting here to tell you that they've become irrelevant, but they've become less important in a world like this. And that is the world that we're in. That is the world to me that we very clearly entered. So the best way to think of the central bank is as a coachman or a coachwoman uh, driving a team of horses. And the team of horses are the commercial banks. And they have the reins that run from the coachman to the, to the, to the commercial banks. They have uh, interest rates. They have uh, liquidity ratios. They have capital ratios. I just think the government's just jumped on the six horses. So it doesn't really matter what the reins are running from the coachman down to the horses. They're, they're now run by something else. So uh, this is more important than the price of money. So if we shouldn't place so much attention on um, interest rates, what indicators should investors be looking at? Well, you should be looking at bank lending because there is this relationship between commercial bank lending and money supply growth. You should be looking at money supply growth as well. Uh, and then those are the sort of statistics that one can be looking at. And then behind that, the soft thing that one is looking at is whether the governments are indeed extending these credit guarantees. And that speech by Macron on the 17th of March and Castex on the 16th of March therefore become crucially important and, and yet unreported. Basically, nobody cares. I mean, so France has a new industrial policy. Who really seems to care about that? But the fact that it's pretty clear it's going to be financed by his banking system uh, using sticks and carrots is revolutionary. It takes us back to a, the way Europe used to be in the, from the 50s and 60s and 70s and the early 1980s, but nobody's paying any attention to it. So those are the three things to look at, bank, bank lending growth, uh, money supply growth, and then on a soft basis, all these policies as they get rolled out uh, across the world, really, across the developed world. What are these three things currently telling you about the outlook for equity markets? Well, what they're telling me is that we've had a huge boost in the supply of money uh, really since the beginning of since, since, since May 2020. Uh, that is rolling off a little bit uh, and the growth rate is coming down, bank credit growth is coming down. But, and here's the big but, if we look at the relationship between the supply of money and inflation, there is usually about an 18 month lag. So you wouldn't really expect all this money creation to have an impact on the consumer price inflation. It might have an impact on asset price inflation, but not consumer price inflation for 18 months. So there's certainly plenty of inflation in the tank uh, is what it's telling me. Uh, what it's also telling me is not to be that concerned about the level of equity markets, that the belief that a ratcheting up of interest rates is going to destroy nominal GDP growth is I think unrealistic. I don't think it's going to happen. Whether there's two issues, do the central banks have the guts for it and they'll certainly talk a good game? And then quite the second question is, will they actually get rates to a level high enough to do it? So I don't think they'll bring growth down uh, enough. And then we could maybe go on to talk about 
within the equity market, which equities are really huge beneficiaries of what's going on here. Because the problem is that the equities that benefit from this monetary revolution are really a small percentage of market capitalization. So it is, you know, someone like me is supposed to say buy equities, sell equities. Uh, but actually, I think it's a bit more nuanced than that. There is a class of equities that can do very well, but the aggregate may not do so well. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely come back to that. As it's just a couple more macro things I want to, to pick through first. So you've kind of touched on this earlier, but financial repression is something that you talk, which you've um, called stealing money from old people slowly. And the idea is that government keeps borrowing rates below inflation so it can flate debt away. Now that sounds very scary, but surely it it kind of makes sense because from the position the government's in and also how can the government necessarily keep borrowing rates down? Yeah, well, so that's right. So uh, we have to forecast government action now. We have to forecast how this can be done. Now, as a citizen, you might have a very different opinion than as a saver. Let me give you the five ways I think that the government could bring this down and then we'll get and that will probably illustrate why it probably is going to be financial repression. So the first one is austerity, which we tried or George Osborne tried, uh, probably related to his departure from office. But there is no uh, need or no uh, political willingness for austerity, which means you know spending less by government. It's not going to happen. Uh, there is very, very high levels of real growth, uh, and I won't go into it in detail, but that would be the revolution that we need. We need a productivity revolution. And while a productivity revolution is not impossible, uh, it is unlikely, and we need a major technological breakthrough. So we can always hope for that, but it's not something that a policymaker can plan on, sitting back, waiting for a productivity revolution, really high levels of real growth, and that bringing down the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, that then takes us to default, but defaulting on your debt, well, someone's debt is somebody else's asset. Uh, as we saw with Lehman Brothers, a 600 billion US dollar default isn't good for growth. Uh, Bank of England estimates that that would take 7% of GDP based upon previous episodes. There's then hyperinflation, but that's a social lottery. Uh, and usually after inflation, you've kind of destroyed the social contract and most politicians wouldn't take that risk. And then that brings us to financial repression. So as you've said, if, in terms of the list of five ways this can be done, uh, if it can't be done by very high real growth, uh, which is you know a lottery really, uh, then it's going to be financial repression, which is so much easier. The second part of your question was how on earth would you do it? How on earth could you keep interest rates below inflation in a world like this? Remember that we, you and I as the savers, are supposed to determine these long-term interest rates, uh, and we are not going to lend money to people at rates below inflation, but yet we are. Uh, and the way this is done is through regulation. So already, depending on where you sit in the spectrum of Savings institutions, many of them are already being forced uh, to buy government debt go through asset liability modeling. And we can ratchet that up. And we do have a complete blueprint for this because this is exactly what was done during World War II and after World War II. And just to put it in context, our level of debt to GDP is above World War II levels. So that's not at the government level. But if you take the government, the household sector, and the non financial corporate sector, we're actually higher than World War II. And the way we solved that problem was to force savings institutions to hold fixed interest securities at low yields when inflation was high. And this is stealing money from old people slowly. And I'm suggesting to you, and you suggested to me, that that is now a legitimate political mechanism because the other ones are even worse. How important are taxes in the picture? Now, there's some talk of windfall taxes. You've got the the Conservative government have put up quite a lot of taxes, allowances have been frozen. In taxes, taxes are definitely part of financial repression. And if anybody who can remember back to that post-war period will know that taxes on capital, taxes on income uh, were much higher. Capital gains tax didn't actually come along until the 1960s, but it was necessary to, to bring it in to deal with issues of uh, arbitrage is the polite phrase in terms of people managing to not pay their taxes. Actually, one of the major cases about putting in corp, uh, capital gains tax related to Norman Wisdom's purchase of gold, something I studied as a young lawyer many, many years ago. So yeah, the secret of taxation is to extract as many feathers from the goose as possible with the least amount of hissing, according to Colbert, the 17th century advisor to Louis XIV. So one of the easiest ways to do that, Mary, is actually inflation itself. And if you look at the British finances, for instance, Rishi Sunak is getting a bit of a windfall from taxation due to what's known as fiscal creep. Uh, and as we get pay rises, or hopefully as we get pay rises, uh, we pay more tax and we creep into that next bracket and there's a bit of a windfall. Uh, 
Uh, if I can move on from Colbert to uh, Lenin, that's Vladimir, not John. Uh, he once said, the way to destroy the bourgeoisie is to grind them between the millstones of inflation and taxation. So, yeah, that's exactly what happens. So uh, you, I, I really want to stress, though, you can achieve quite a lot of it just with inflation. Uh, but ultimately, uh, taxation also plays a role. And the other thing you, you touched on earlier, but clear, clearly tensions between the West and China are rising. You've written about deglobalization helping along with government control and money supply to push us into a new capital cycle. Please, can you explain what you think is going on here and what the implications are for investors? Yeah, so I've, I've talked about it for a long time. And then Janet Yellen summed it up in a soundbite, a fantastic soundbite. And this was, I think, on the 14th of April. Friend Shoring. What a great name. You know, it, it sounds like motherhood and apple pie really, doesn't it? I mean, if you're going to come up with an extreme policy, it is great to give it a good name. And I'd certainly never have thought of Friend Shoring. I don't know if she thought of herself or she had a, an advertising agency helping her. But Friend Shoring is where we only buy products from people who are our friends. That's the basic point of it. And also, we, that would mean building capacity uh, to produce these products only in places where people are our friends. Now, in terms of people who aren't our friends, she only mentioned two countries in that entire speech at the Atlantic Council in the middle of April. One you'll not be surprised to know was Russia, but the other one was China. Now, she left the window open for China to become a friend, but made it pretty clear in her statements that China was not currently behaving like a friend. So uh, friend shoring means a massive redirection in the flow of goods, but prior to that, a massive redirection in the flow of capital, which we are already seeing. In March alone, foreign investors pulled 17.5 billion US dollars from RMB denominated uh, portfolio assets. Uh, what behind the scenes, we may be seeing a significant retreat by foreign bankers in terms of their foreign currency lending in China, but even maybe their RMB lending in China. So we have this retreat of capital from China uh, but if Janet Yellen is correct, it's going to end in a fairly clear and what she refers to as a bipolar world. Not my words, her words. And in a bipolar world, it's not just goods and services that don't shift between the two sides of the bipolar world. It's also capital. So in discussions with my institutional clients, I think the terminal value of their Chinese investments is zero. Not because the share prices go to zero. There's another way you can lose all your money, which is they don't let you sell the currency. So you sell your share, you get B, and then you can't sell the B. There are already significant restrictions on the ability of the Chinese citizen to remove their capital from China. But I think the same thing will come uh, for foreigners as well. So that, so that is, you know, there's, we can talk, I mean, the ramifications for this are huge and uh, we could talk about them for a long time, but in, in, sh in the short term, that's the implication, I think, for capital flows, stock markets uh, and financial markets, uh, the Chinese financial markets in particular. Yeah, it's interesting. There was a recent article about China announcing plans to push more pension savings into the stock market, and that's luring international investors. D do you think China is investable? Do you think people in the UK should be investing in China? Chinese so no, no is a simple answer. The, the chances of going to a pi bipolar world Chances of not going to a bipolar world are about one in five, I would say, because of what China has been up to and because of this reaction that the West has made. So there's a one in five chance that everything goes on as normal. But I think there's a four in five chance uh, that it doesn't. So I would put that down as uninvestable. I, I should say in the background to this, I've never invested in China anyway. Uh, and that's because of my undue respect for property rights which I consider to be the very basis of investment. And without them, then you do, I do feel that it's quite a dangerous place to invest in. That's why I never invested in Russia. In China, of course, it's different. I'm not saying China is exactly like Russia. But we have to believe that as owners of assets in China, we could take a legal action against the government and exert our property rights against government action. And I have zero faith that I would ever be able to do that. I have faith that I can do that in France and Germany and Italy and United Kingdom and America, but I have no faith that I could do that in China. So that's a different structural issue behind this, what's going on here. But the, f the first issue is this bipolar world. We, well, many people of my age anyway, remember a bipolar world, which was called the Cold War. And capital did not flow freely between uh, the Soviet Union and the West. And I think that is the, you know, that is the direction of travel here. And I, I, you know, we all hope that we don't head to a bipolar world because there are 
if it's a cold war there were hot flashes in the last one and hundreds of thousands of people died so we're all hoping that we can avoid the bipolar world but it's looking very like it at the minute and to me that means china's uninvestable do you think your training as a lawyer and your time living in hong kong gives you better insight than you might have had otherwise or than me and the listeners might have well i don't know about better different i think is probably a better way of putting it because obviously i missed out on a great chinese bull market at various stages so it's uh if one has this focus on the fundamentals on the structural uh you can miss a lot of parties uh, but, uh, you know, I missed a few parties in Russia as well. So it's a focus, I think, that is important. Uh, and it depends on your time horizon. If you're trading markets, and I hope nobody listening to this is a trader of markets, but as an investor. But if you're trading markets, then perhaps it's not that important. But if you're an investor, I, I can think of a few things that are, that are more important. So perhaps training as a lawyer uh, was a good, uh, produces a good focus. Remember, the, the greatest investor in the world is a lawyer. He's not an economist or investor. As far as I know, he's got no formal qualifications in finance whatsoever. Uh, and his name is Charlie Munger. We said earlier that we'd come back to where the value is in the equity markets. You talked about this reallocation capital of China. Does that, that could be a huge shift. Does that, does that play into where the opportunities are within equities? Yeah, I, I absolutely think it does. And it needs some, you know, radical thinking and it needs some radical behavior, given that the stock market indices in the developed world are obviously completely dominated by the winners of the last 30 years, which are tech stocks, but also companies that have benefited from a disinflation. So the argument runs that the place where you really want to invest is everything that's kind of been destroyed by China over the last 30 years. We have moved production there. They produced at an undervalued exchange rate. They produced with capital that was cheaply priced by the state. They were able to outcompete and destroy most businesses. And let's go and look at some of those businesses, like steel, for instance. The fact that our steel companies have survived at all is pretty re remarkable. And they may actually only have survived with a little bit of government support themselves. But I think it means that they're quite good companies. Now, I know most people will be deeply skeptical about that. But if you manage to survive competing with China for the last 30 years, then you're probably a reasonably good company. And we know there's not many of those companies left in this country, but there's a lot of them left in places like China, or sorry, Japan, South Korea. And they're kind of scattered across the planet. They're in Germany, they're in France, they're in the United States. Those companies now see the yoke of Chinese competition lifted. Uh, they become essential to us. And what I get all the time is, oh, but they're not green. We can't invest in these companies because they're not green. Well, we can make steel in this country and, and in Europe and in America a lot greener than the Chinese can. And that technology is coming along leaps and bounds. There was a major breakthrough in terms of using hydrogen for steel production just announced just yesterday. So those are the types of companies that now begin to uh, now begin to benefit. The problem is they're such a small percentage of market capitalization that most fund managers would not have courage to significantly overcommit to that portion of the market. Who wants to own chemical manufacturers, steel manufacturers, shipyards? Uh, the British government just announced a national shipyard project and shipbuilding project. You know, the world is changing and the equity markets are always far, far behind in their structure. They're always full of yesterday's winners. So I know most people who probably come on this podcast, Mary, tell everybody to invest in index funds. But to me, index funds are now the great trap. By finding the right active manager who can has the courage to do these things and the ability to do these things and the skill set to do these things. Well, that's a challenge. But the index, equity index fund, I think, is a dangerous product. Ah, that's interesting. That was I wanted to ask you about that. So you said it's a challenge to find the right fund manager. How how might you do it? So there is a there is labeling in our business. It's, it's a horrible business where everybody has to be in a little pigeonhole. Uh, I think probably most people know that one of those pigeonholes is called value investing. And uh, a bit like all the businesses I've mentioned, it's kind of been destroyed over this period as well, particularly over the last, particularly since the launch of quantitative easing. Value investing has had a particularly difficult time relative to growth stocks. Uh, now, value investing, I mean, once again, we could do a whole day's lecture on value investing, but it's probably best summed up by Warren Buffett when he said, price is what you pay, the value is what you get. Uh, and it's trying to find things that are reasonably priced. I think when you do that calculation today, you end up in many of the stocks that I'm talking about, not necessarily those types of stocks, but I think you'll find a value manager is likely to have more of those industries I've just mentioned. Uh, I did once 
do a search. There are 120,000 open-ended funds across the planet, according to the Investment Company Institute. And I did try to search for any that were called the Heavy Industry Fund, uh, and I could only find one, which was in Korea, the Korean Heavy Industry Fund. So it's going to be very difficult to find anybody who's specializing specifically in those old economy stocks. But if they have the name value uh, the, uh, in their marketing literature, it is more likely that they're going to end up owning some of those stocks. So this is, uh, well, another Buffett quote. It's simple but not easy to find these managers. But that's where you should be looking around. Yeah, it's interesting. It's very... Um gray distinction between growth and value and that there's talk of the rotation i mean to an extent that it's definitely started to play out already the nasdaq's down 25 percent year to date how i mean you talk about mean reversion would you expect value and growth stocks to mean revert to the same level and how do you know when it's played out yeah, so, so the problem is if we look at the valuation of U.S. equities, uh, and I'm going to value them relative to their assets, and let's just call it the replacement value of their assets. It's something called the Q ratio. That ratio, the ratio of the market capitalization of U.S. equities to the replacement value of their assets, is at an all-time high. It's above 2000. It's way above 1929. And if we're talking about mean reversion and aggregate for equities, you can imagine that that does not augur good returns for US equities. So you've got to be a little bit more circumspect in what you buy. Value equities look uh, much more reasonable. I was going to read something from John Maynard Keynes actually to explain how this works and maybe in the context of that, uh, explain why this change in China has such a profound impact on this value cycle. So here we go from uh, the general theory of employment, interest and money. The daily revolutions of the stock exchange, though primarily made to facilitate transfers of old investments between one individual and another, inevitably exert a decisive influence on the rate of current investment. For there's no sense in building up a new enterprise at a cost greater than that at which a similar enterprise can be purchased. Whilst there is an inducement to spend on a new project, what may seem an extravagant sum if it can be floated off on the stock exchange at an immediate profit. I think people will probably recognize a bit of what's been going on there. Uh, and we have been creating a certain type of company which can be floated off on the stock exchange at an exorbitant profit. Uh, but what we haven't been doing, because the valuations for the stocks I mentioned have been so low, is they've effectively been starved of capital for such a prolonged period of time. Uh, and the argument goes that that is where you invest, because the mean reversion there can be the other way. It can now be on the upside. Because starving an industry of capital means on the longer term, the returns should go up. And crucially, if we suddenly just stopped buying stuff from China, that, that cycle would, would mean revert very quickly. And if that profit cycle mean reverts very quickly, the valuation of those stocks should mean revert very quickly. So in aggregate, the Q ratio is at an all-time high. A mean reversion is not going to be good for return on the index. Uh, but within that, based on Keynes's analysis, we could indeed see a massive uh, increase in the return on capital for certain types of industries, and that would be very beneficial for the stocks. Yeah, I, I was interesting. Do, do you have a view on sort of looking at countries versus looking at sectors? This is very much the sectors that will benefit. How closely? Because I think I think investors often categorise by geography rather than by sector. Yeah, well, it's sort of my job to recognize uh, to recommend countries, and I would say for the last twenty five years, I spend most of my time recommending countries, and. Now, I think it is a time to move on direct to looking at industries, and I've just covered that. Uh, in terms of countries, there is a very distinct line to be drawn between countries that have far too much debt to GDP and those that have really not got very much. And uh, there's lots of data from this from the BIS. And when you look at it, it, it just jumps off the page that the entire developed world is overgeared. It's got record high debt to GDP ratios. The only exa the only uh, exception to that may be Germany, which is you know irrelevant, given that it's within the European Union and within the Eurozone. Uh, but everybody else has got too much debt to GDP. And going back to the five ways we get rid of it, the politicians are going to have to choose which one it is, and I think it's going to be financial repression. But if you look at the emerging markets, with the exception of China, that's not where we are. The emerging markets have got very low levels of debt to GDP, which may be a legacy from that Asian financial crisis, where they simply learned a lesson that they shouldn't uh, be running up too much debt. So uh, there are lots of downsides on the uh, bipolar world we go into with China. 
for emerging markets and the transition period can be painful. But in the long run, if they haven't got a lot of debt, they are beneficiaries ultimately of a world seeking to friend shore. As long as Janet Yellen believes they are friends, they should be in receipt of capital inflow. They should be in receipt of orders for their goods. They don't have a lot of debt to GDP and the valuations are much, much lower than the United States. So I'm not suggesting that the great wrench between China and the developed world is without pain. Uh, but if we're looking at countries, then many of the Asian emerging markets are looking much better at value and with a much lower debt to GDP ratio, the returns from their equity markets over the long term uh, should be better, but they will be volatile given this relationship with China and how quickly it might change. What roughly is the geographical asset allocation of your own investments? <laughs> well, I'm trying to own more value funds, as you can imagine. And geographically, I, that's quite hard for me to work out. But I, I would say it's, it's definitely biased towards Japan, mm-hmm. uh, which is, I think, is a major beneficiary of rising inflation, but also the turn in the capital cycle and also this wrench with China. I mean, there is no doubt as to which side of the bipolar world Japan will be on. When it finally comes along, and I think that will be to uh, be to its benefit. Uh, but beyond that, I don't think there's a, a major uh, uh, sort of geographical alloc- allocation. I think it tends to be more on the on an industrial uh, an industrial basis of industries and value rather than geography. So it's Japan, and a little bit more in emerging markets, I suppose, than the average person, but nothing uh, particularly aggressive in that front. It's interesting that y- your sort of view against index funds. What would you recommend someone who doesn't know that much about investing wants to learn wants to get started how how should they approach investing because it might be quite difficult to monitor active funds uh indeed so uh that's an incredibly difficult question to answer because it's like how long is a piece of string i mean there is there is really no shortcut to to doing this I would, if you can find uh, value managers online talking about what they do for a living, or maybe even if you want to attend a small value conference where people discuss this, and then just think about what they're saying. You may think it's just nonsense and Tommy rot and you don't want anything to do with it. Uh, But to be comfortable with uh, the manager is obviously very important. So if there is a half day online conference on value investing, listen in, see if it's for you, see if any of those managers seem to speak uh, more sense than uh, more sense than others. There's obviously some great books written by value managers. Actually, Richard Oldfield has written Simple but Not Easy, which is a great read and a very simple book and a very straightforward book, which you could could read. But I'm afraid that's the problem with investing. The problem is that you know I've been doing it for 33 years, uh, and I think my I don't know if my education is half complete yet, Mary. But you know, after 33 years, it certainly isn't complete. But that's where I would start. You have to be comfortable. With the manager, so so listen to some people who call themselves value managers. Come to your own conclusions as to whether that's an approach that you think is reasonable. And uh, and thirty three years later, you might have some of the right answers, and then you might not. Yeah. What are your thoughts on um, Hendrik Bessenbinder's research, which I think is sort of that the majority of stock market returns are driven by four percent of stocks over a very long period of time. <laughs> yeah, that would be great if you could pick them. So. Uh, my my skepticism is an ability to pick them. Uh, there are always people who've done it. So now, now I'm saying that I know I can't pick them. So now can I pick the people who can pick them? And the fact that someone's done it doesn't necessarily mean to say that I would have been able to pick them uh, in advance. So I uh, accept the research, accept that this happens, but find it very difficult to say that we could pick the person who could pick the stocks that can do it. And we can all think of examples who have done it. But I don't think at the time, I'm thinking back to the 60s, there's an amazing man, I think he's still alive, he's in his 90s, called Arthur Rock, who seemed to pick four technology winners in the 1960s. Uh, But the fact that he's the only one from the great technology boom of the 1960s that we could probably name uh, does suggest how incredibly difficult it is. So it's not an approach that I can use personally because I can't pick technology winners. And I think the best in mind the research suggests is really breakthroughs in technology, but nor can I pick the people who can pick the technology. So I'm not prepared to uh, swing for the fences, as Mr. Buffett says. We're getting a lot of Warren Buffett in this, aren't we? (laughs) Uh, So I'll go for the ones and the twos and and not the swings for the fences. Back to the inflation point, I think conventionally people like real assets for inflation protection. 
So what are your thoughts on property and infrastructure, investment trusts? I don't, I don't know if you, maybe that's a bit out of your area, but they're quite, they're, they're very popular. They're trading on high premiums, which may be one of the problems. I think the way the NAV's calculated can be a bit opaque. But um, yeah, what are your thoughts on these as a way of diversifying? And Well, it's, it's, it's a really fascinating subject because in a world of financial repression, it doesn't work the way you think it's going to work. In a world of financial repression, or in the world that we've lived in, credit was freely available to anybody at the right price. I mean, there really almost wasn't anybody who couldn't borrow at the right interest rate. Uh, in America, dogs used to get applications for credit cards, you know, so anybody could get credit. Now, the problem with the new world is actually credit's incredibly cheap. If I'm right about financial repression, nominal rates are well below inflation, so everybody will want it. But of course, financial repression itself doesn't work if everybody rushes out and borrows because debt now grows faster than GDP. So rather than rationing or controlling the flow of credit by using interest rates, we're going to have to do it via administrative means. This is important in answering your question because all, of, because all the assets you just mentioned are currently highly geared assets. And their ability to roll over that gearing and maybe even add more will play a fundamental role in the future direction of their prices. So I want to divide property into two bits, uh, potentially even three bits, but two bits which is residential property. There is no way that a government will staunch the flow of credit to residential property. I, I guess that's pretty depressing if you're young and you look at the existing prices, but it's, uh, it's a political necessity to keep that credit flowing to residential property. So I think residential property will do well. I should add, however, that there are different types of residential property. Uh, and I think, let's call it the man in the street, the residential property of the man in the street should do exceptionally well. And particularly in parts of this country that will benefit from this reindustrialization, this friend shoring. Uh, and I like to mention Blythe, Northumberland, because I know property is incredibly cheap there, but that's where we're building the vault, the, the great big battery plant, and high quality jobs are coming back to, to near Blythe, North, Northumberland, and places like that are relatively cheap. I'm not sure about the property of the plutocrats, if we want to call them that, in certain areas of London, et cetera, et cetera, in a world where we are uh, stealing money from old people slowly. I'm not so sure about that. But across the United Kingdom, I think we can see it already, but in other areas, property prices are going up. Now, I want to contrast that with commercial property. I, one of the great fortunes made in the last few decades has been to gear up commercial property. It has its own challenges now in a post-COVID work-from-home world. But I think it will have a bigger challenge. And I'm pretty sure that going forward, governments will wish to see that de-geared. If there's a part, the governments are not going to be deciding who de-gears and who re-gears. And they're so keen to gear up uh, industrial property, if you like, and rebuild all of that capacity. Uh, they can't stop it flowing to residential property because that's a political necessity to keep doing that. But I think we may see the re-equitization of commercial property. And returns from commercial property may be a lot worse uh, than they have been. But residential property, yeah, I absolutely think that will do well, but one needs to choose wisely uh, in picking them and to think beyond where the great property booms have been for the last uh, 30 odd years and to think in other parts of this United Kingdom and uh, capital and credit reaching parts that it hasn't really reached for a very long period of time. I would like to say that's leveling up, but I think it's not a government policy. I think it's happening by accident and the government leveling up policy may be riding on the coattails of it, but I think it's happening anyway. Do you think re-equitisation generally is something that, that there needs to be more of? And what are sort of the pros and cons there? Yes. So, th so that would be my solution to making this as, as less painful as possible, would be to force a rapid re-equitisation, which is painful. It's certainly painful for people who've benefited from levering up using debt to, uh, to create a lot of wealth, create a lot of wealth. Well, make a lot of wealth for themselves. I'm not sure they create a lot of wealth by gearing up existing assets. So if, uh, you know, if I was the chancellor, I'd be doing everything I could that in certain sections of the economy, not the sections of the economy where the money and the credit has been used to create productive assets, but where it's simply been used for financial engineering, I would do everything I could to force a rapid re-equitization and get our debt to GDP ratio lower than that way. Will it happen? No, it won't happen because the people who use that debt are the most politically powerful people on the planet and therefore they will push back strongly against it. But to the benefit of all of us, and particularly those of us who want to continue to run a system that is, let's say, capitalist in nature, rather than being capitalist, capitalist in nature, the sooner we can get to a re-equitization, the better. But I'm afraid the people who 
basically run the world have made so much money out of doing it a different way that uh, it's not going to be turned around anytime quickly. Sorry if this comes across as an ignorant question, but I think the modern monetary theorists would say that debt levels don't matter. What? Why does it matter that we have huge rising records yeah, so debt levels? They, they, they would say debt doesn't matter because you can print as much money as you like and ultimately you can inflate it away. Now, I don't know whether they would say that that publicly, but you know I've read the... Uh, Randall Ray, and also the other book called Modern Monetary Theory, and that's absolutely what it's all about. So to me, it's absolutely, that takes you to hyperinflation, which they would also refute, but I cannot see anything in, in either of the treaties that, that suggests we don't get to hyperinflation. And I'd say to them, well, that's a lottery. If you want to destroy capital and destroy wealth, well, we've done that before. And in the political lottery that follows, you don't always get a better world. You can get a much, much more unstable world. So I would say to them that that does matter. Because if your only way of getting rid of it is effectively through hyperinflation, then you're taking a great political lottery. So I don't think we're going to go that route. I think we're going to go the financial repression route, which is, you know, high-ish inflation. But remember, there's a technical definition of hyperinflation, and that's 60% per month. Per month, not per, per annum. Uh, and I think these people who believe that they can just destroy debt and not upset the uh, kind of social political balance in a dangerous way, are fooling themselves. They think they can do it. They're sure they can do it, and they're sure they can do it with social cohesion. But I don't see much in financial history or political history that tells me such cohesion can be maintained as you don't steal money from old people slowly, but steal it from old people incredibly quickly and then steal an incredible amount of it, which I think is the natural consequence of MMT and something they know, but something that they wouldn't like to admit to publicly. I came to a brilliant talk of yours a couple of weeks ago hosted by the CFA Institute where you were running through mistakes of financial history. We've actually covered quite a lot of these in the conversation already, but one was the most dangerous thing is a search for yield. I think you're saying John Bull can stand many things, but he cannot stand a yield of 2%. I wondered why you think this is so dangerous. Yeah, so that was a quote from Walter Badgett from the uh, from the 19th century. And I have read a lot in fiction but also in financial history about what is the rate of interest that we all think we deserve and i use the word deserve because that's not really a very rational word to use and the answer seems to be five percent to have capital of course you have to earn it and then you have to pay tax on it and then what's left well one percent doesn't really seem very much so if the rate of interest comes down to very low levels and it did really do that in the late 19th century in particular we roam the world looking for our 5%. And life is usually fairly straightforward. There's a direct relationship between the yield you look for and the risk inherent in the yield. There are occasional anomalies, and good luck to anybody looking for them. And please let me know if you can find them. I'd love to get a safe 5%. But basically, we take higher risk with capital in pursuit of yield. And it's this old thing. It's kind of a, maybe it stems from a, a Protestant work ethic or whatever that we like to divide up the return on capital between capital gains and and income. It kind of seems like a cultural thing, particularly uh, in Northern Europe and in Europe. And we go out and and take massive risks with capital in pursuit of yield. So it's been there since time immemorial. Clearly, we've just lived through a period of very low interest rates and are living still with a period of low interest rates. So you can expect lots of speculation. Let's go back to Warren Buffett. It's only when the tide goes out that you can see who's been swimming without trunks. And the tide is beginning to go out, and there's evidently been a lot of risk taking, some of it on gearing and debt. And uh, that's what always happens when interest rates go to a low level. But uh, there's lots of people out there. And it's really sad because not long ago, I met a man who's just cashed in his pension scheme. You you can cash in your defined benefit pension scheme for a large lump sum. And him and all his friends had been buying shares in a Portuguese vineyard because it offered them 5%. Now, I really, really hope that the Portuguese vineyard is legit, and I really hope it does produce yields of 5%, but I suspect that this is a risk on a much higher level than the people who cashed in their defined benefit pension schemes could ever imagine. We're going to have to have you back on because we're running out of time and I've got so much else I want to ask. Just two more questions to finish up. First one, you are the keeper of mistakes. What do you think have been your own biggest mistakes in terms of market predictions or failing to spot something? So my, I know exactly where I've been wrong, which is when bull markets are on their way, I've always left too early. Uh, it was always easy, I think, 
I mean, it should be easy to find the bottoms. I've written a book about it so everybody can read that. And actually it has worked quite well, even as recently as 2009 and actually in, in 2020. It was a bit, you know, a month late, but, but anyway, not too bad. But writing out bull markets is incredibly difficult because as a kind of long-term fundamental investor, you can see when the value is gone, you can see when the speculation is there. So have I learned anything from that? Well, nothing particularly rational, except the great saying by someone I work with on my course, uh, just to repeat the practical history of financial markets course, which is now known as advanced valuation in financial markets, and one's taking the online version. But Gordon Pepper once said that when you see something in a market that is unsustainable, use every power of rationality to work out how long it can be sustained, then double it and take off a month. And when it comes to working out how long a bull market can be prolonged, that may be as good as any, but I think that's the most difficult bit of investing. It's taking that, that last bit, and that last bit can be pretty significant. I mean, in terms of returns, that blow off can be pretty significant. So that's been my failure. I'm working on it. So I try and get some natural optimism from somewhere. I think maybe I need more sunlight, Mary. That might help. Yeah, you need to get out of Scotland. <laughs> Never. <laughs> um, and this, the final question, so we talked about your mistakes. Our listeners are mainly private investors. What do you think are the most common mistakes that private investors make? High turnover. I mean, that doesn't affect all private investors, but I think the time comes when there's too high a turnover and uh, uh, people turn over too much. Search for yield, which we've already covered, is, you know, I, I really think private investors need to break down this sort of ingrained belief that yield is important. I mean, total return is what's important. I realize it's treated differently for tax purposes, but really the pursuit of yield at the risk of capital is one of the great mistakes that you know, everybody makes and uh, private investors uh, particularly make. And I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same mistake we all make in different fields, which is to believe the hype. So I recommend, and this, you know, I, I run the library of mistakes. The most annoying question I get asked about the library of mistakes is, what's the one book I should read in the library of mistakes? And the whole point of having a library is there is no one book. But anyway, the one book is Triumph of the Optimist by Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton. And it just, in many ways, it's a very boring book, but it runs through the history of returns from cash, from bonds and equities. Uh, over the 100 years, over the 20th century. And it calibrates you to what is reasonable and what is possible. And, and let me give away the punchline. It is reasonable to expect over the very long term, a return from equities of about 6% per annum in real terms. And if anybody is out there selling you something much higher than that, then they are either a genius, which is possible, there are a very few of them, or they're taking far too much risk. So I think, one of the problems, I think, with retail investors is the calibration is wrong. I think we, we used to take polls and ask investors what they thought the average long-term return from equities was. Now, it varies a lot as to whether it's that you're in a bull market or a bear market. But in some bull markets, the answer is 20%. You know, the real answer is 6 to 6.5%. But often, retail investors believe it's 20 So they go chasing returns that are just highly likely to be speculative and risky. So think that six, six and a half real after inflation, uh, frankly, I'd be delighted to get that. The compounding impact of that in real terms is spectacular. And be very wary of anybody who's offering you something significantly more than, uh, not the minute given where interest rates are, we should be calibrating ourselves, given where interest rates are and given where the, the, the valuation of US equities is, we should be calibrating our sums to ourselves to something a bit more reasonable. So people have too high an expectation, in particular on what equities can do for them. Yeah. Well, Russell, we're out of time. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And for listeners um, who have enjoyed this and want to hear more from Russell, he did an excellent episode on the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast with Jeremy Hosking and Steve Clapham, which was published recently. I recommend you listen to that. And also he hosts the Library of Mistakes podcast, which you can find on all usual podcast stores. Thank you very much.